could you be uh, exactly precise about how the arrow of time comes into this? Am, am I right in thinking that you, it's all happening in one space time and somewhere there is a, uh, whether it's conformally flat or something, and this is, so to speak, a initial condition or a boundary condition that you assume. Is that, is that correct, Andrew? I, I would call it a boundary condition rather than an initial condition because the, in, in the, you're talking about the steady state model. Or, so in the steady state eternal inflation model, there's a boundary condition which is put on this infinite null surface. So, it's a, so I wouldn't call that a, an initial because oh, yeah, it's not a time. I missed that it's a, um, a, a null surface. Yes. But, it is, but it's some surface on which you would put those conditions on the field and, and the metric. So this would fit into the framework of, of the past hypothesis. Somewhere there is some very special condition which explains why we have an arrow yes. of time. So, so yes, so I think, um, I, think I would not say that that is a generic set of boundary conditions for that surface. It's very much not. So, so I would call that a low entropy boundary condition that is, that is put and that the entropy basically evolves toward higher values away from that surface, hmm. in both toward the bottom and top of the page. Hmm. So I would say it, it, doesn't, it doesn't solve the, er solve the arrow of time. It, it has an arrow of time that is there by virtue of the fact that you put a boundary condition in, which is low entropy. Um, thank you. Very nice talk. Just two brief comments and a question. The one brief comment, I agree that the um, the, the emergent universe is probably pro problematic, but I think it's worth exploring. Um, the, co the comment is that you, you say that the distinction between the infinite and finite depends on the surface of constant time and there are no preferred time surfaces. My position is that there are preferred time surfaces in the real universe and they are defined by starting at the Big Bang and measuring proper time along Ricci eigenlines and that that gives you a preferred set of surfaces in space-time and that those are the ones one should use. And I have reasons for saying that which I could explore. The question is the following. Um, it, when you were talking about the, the, the eternal bubbles taking place, you had two parameters there, lambda and h. And these are basically arbitrary because there's no fundamental physics which determines them. Surely there are values of lambda and h in which the universe does not inflate eternally because the, the nucleation takes place so fast that it eats up all the available space and eternal inflation comes to an end. Yes, that is, well, that's a comment, but uh, it, it's true. Um, but it's generically, so, so the computation of lambda, the nucleation rate, will depend on the structure of the potential. But you have to, uh, as long as the, the energy scale of the potential is significantly below the Planck scale, it will tend to be exponentially suppressed. The, the nucleation will tend to be exponentially suppressed. Um, so that lambda is going to tend to be quite small. Now, if you, no, you certainly can come up with models where it's not, and inflation would not be eternal. Um, if you have a picture where the potential is very complicated, like in the string theory landscape, for example, this is almost certainly true because in the landscape, if you have some high energy vacuum, it would then have hundreds of different directions in which to tunnel. And um, the, well, you'd, you'd have many different minima, and you just have to hit one of them that has a long enough lifetime in order to drive eternal inflation. So it would be very hard. Um, you'd kind of have to, to have, one, to have a model like that not be eternal, you'd have to go through a whole chain, all of which transition really quickly, even though they're getting low energy and they're on dimensional grounds, it's very hard to make the tunneling rate uh, large when you get to low enough energy. So what you say is true, but I think it, it, it's very much easier to get an exponentially suppressed tunneling rate than a very high tunneling rate relative to, to H. So if the inflation was power law, each place presumably it would complete. If it was... Uh, I'm I mean, that was one of the reasons why people became interested in power law inflation, because you could complete uh, in old inflation, you could complete the... Even with the quantum fluctuations, though? <coughs> Don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. So, uh, integration with neighboring fields is one of um, a virtue of our physical theory. So, if you're doing cosmologies, uh, the neighboring fields with which you will want to integrate is obviously 
particle physics. And the heart of uh, inflation is, to put it, a scalar field. But if I'm not mistaken, there are, in particle physics, no known particles which can do the duty for being this scalar field. At the beginning, it, if I'm not mistaken, it was thought to be the Higgs field, which we do this duty, but it was shown that it cannot do do this. So basically, all the the properties of the field you're positing at ad hoc and just arbitrary to, to fulfill the, the need of your model. So it's a, a very high theoretical cost. But at the same time, it's not clear that uh, it's doing any duty because the, the three things you want to explain uh, by inflation, which is that the universe is f almost uh, exactly flat, that it's homogeneous, and that we don't observe magnetic monopoles, it's not clear that these are things which we need to explain. The initial condition could be just set so that the universe was perfectly homogeneous and perfectly flat f f from the beginning. So this, and it's not clear that initial conditions have to be explained. At concerning monopoles, magnetic monopoles, well, we've not observed them anywhere, so perhaps they don't exist. And if they exist, then perhaps they're just very hard to explain. So the problem with this model is that you have a high theoretical cost and no real uh, explanatory duty for the scalar field which you're positing. Okay, well that's a lot of comments, but in, in order, I think, so that I would say that um, it's true that we don't know if inflation is driven by a scalar field, which it doesn't necessarily have to be, but that's the simplest model. It's true that none of the currently known scalar fields, which is one, which is the Higgs field, which at least we think exists now, um, can do the job. But I think it's good news that scalar fields do seem to exist, the Higgs. It's also true that we seem to observe vacuum energy, um, the dark energy that we see astronomically. That could be other things, but the simplest model is vacuum energy. So I think we'd, we believe that vacuum energy and scalar fields exist, and this is a new version of a scalar field with, with vacuum energy that's higher. But it's true that we don't know what the funnel, you know, it doesn't, there's no particle physics reason other than maybe the string theory landscape that we would believe in such a field. Um, I agree with you that if we just wanted to uh, say that the universe is flat and homogeneous, those are the two things we would assume anyway if we didn't know anything else because they're kind of the simplest things. Um, so inflation is a way to sort of explain those, but you might argue that philosophically you don't need to. I think what's most impressive that inflation does is not either of those, but the fluctuations. So that you see a particular, a very particular form of fluctuations. Those also you might guess. Scale invariant is a nice thing to guess. Gaussian is a nice thing to guess. Um, what you probably wouldn't guess is that they weren't quite scale invariant, but only close to scale invariant. Um, and that's something that the observations confirmed that inflation somewhat predicted. Um, and it may be that, that we see new things in observational data. So inflation does make additional predictions like that you could see uh, tensor modes from gravity waves and so on that can genuinely be tested and are being tested. You know, maybe Thursday we'll hear that there are gravity waves, maybe not. I'm guessing not, but we'll see. I hope I'm wrong. Um, but the point is that the prediction is out there that could be tested, and that would be more of a smoking gun for inflation. So I, I think that's a, a very good point that, uh, that I've made in the past, that some of the things that inflation purportedly explains can be explained just on sort of basic grounds that what else would you assume? Um, but I do think it makes predictions that are much more impressive, especially the fluctuations. So about this these uh, space times where the spatial slices were finite or infinite depending on the slicing use. Is that generic or are there space times, are there universes whose spatial slices are either always finite or always infinite in any achronal spatial slicing? Um, I think, so there certainly are, so a closed FRW model that expands and recollapses, you can't make any infinite slices in that, so, so that's certainly true. Um, I would say that in infinite FRW model, um, I'm not sure that you could foliate the whole thing in finite slices. You, you could create a bunch of finite slices, but I'm not sure that you could foliate the whole thing. I'd have to think about that a little more. Um, so I think there probably are, yeah, of, of either type, and this is just one of the ambiguous ones. 
Um, just a, a very quick question, quite a minor one really, but I think one place where the philosophers might be able to help uh, us physicists is just on your move there from when one goes from steady state inflation to the perfect cosmological principle. I think in the original steady steady state model that was quite an easy easy move. I think it's 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 a lot more prob not problematic here. You very quickly run into the you know the whole problem of locality versus things which are global. I mean, just for example, we you know we can't help looking at it from our portion of the universe. Now, if one is talking about steady state, you know, during the period of inflation, well, obviously that there's a slight problem that you know, one has to think about. Well, in our universe, looking at the cosmic microwave background, it comes to an end at one stage. So there's a little paradox. On the other hand, is if one's talking about steady state inflation at a global level, then one has to explain why does it come to an end, et cetera, et cetera. Could you say maybe just a little on that? Well, I think it's, it's steady state globally, but not locally in the sense that um, it's true that every, so it's statistically a steady state. So what I would say is that there is a statistical characterization of the universe where those statistical properties are homogeneous, isotropic, and time translation invariant, but that you know, any given point in the universe will not necessarily obey those, which is the same as the steady state. You had galaxies, right, which were not in a steady state. Um, you know, th they were for a time different. And then I, get, I can't remember exactly what happened to galaxies, but I guess they fell apart and got replaced by other ones. Or, uh, but so I think locally, certainly there's evolution and there, there is a departure from steady state, but it's the globe, it's just like the, the classic cosmological principle. It's not an exact, it's not an exact symmetry everywhere, you know, in terms of the actual state, because that would make it really boring and, and uniform, at least at a classical level, but rather it's a st statistical symmetry. Hoyle did develop with Gnarly Carr eventually a sort of model of steady state that had little bangs everywhere. Yeah. But we can see in retrospect that the one big trick that he missed in the original steady state, he could have predicted the irregularity spectrum of the universe. You know, the constant curvature spectrum is the one and only spectrum that's consistent with the perfect cosmological principle, but he didn't do that. Okay, well that's the end of our session. Let's thank Anthony again thanks. very clear for the question. <laughs>